Thank you so much for watching Landom Sea Goes There. Please subscribe and hit the like button and the bell notification button. Silkwood is a 1983 biographical drama film that was directed by Mike Nichols and it stars Meryl Streep, Cher, and Kurt Russell. The screenplay was done by Nora Ephron and Alice Arlen, who adapted it from the book Who Killed Karen Silkwood by writer Howard Cohen. The movie is based on a true story. The film begins and ends with Karen Silkwood driving along a lonely road in 1974, heading to a meeting with a New York Times reporter in order to deliver evidence of negligence at the Kerr-McGee plant in Cimarron, Oklahoma. The rest of the film flashes back to Karen's private life with her lover and her loose-living friends. All this is done in contrast to her humdrum job that she has at Kerr-McGee. Or at least it was that way until Karen and several other employees became contaminated by radiation while working there. Management at the plant wants to sweep this incident under the rug, but Karen thinks differently and feels like something's fishy. She informs the union of that fact. X-rays of the faulty fuel rods and written proof of the inadequate safety measures at the plant that caused Karen's illness are tampered with. This forces Karen to conduct her own private investigation. As she begins to gather evidence, she becomes obsessed with the fact that she needs to gather it. She finally collects enough of this evidence and organizes it into a briefcase and heads off to meet with a Times reporter. But she never makes it there. The official report on her fatal auto accident is that Miss Silkwood had been drinking and was under the influence of tranquilizers. Director Mike Nichols and the screenwriter Nora Ephron plus Alice Arlen, surround this true story with a really lively, improvisational atmosphere. This brings out the best in all the actors. Plus, it also provides probably the fullest on-screen realization of the director's theater-based techniques of realistic, character-centered, dialogue-driven filmmaking. The film was shot largely in New Mexico, and Texas on a budget of about $10 million. The factual accuracy in the film was tried to be maintained throughout the entire script, but who knows what the real truth behind all this is. One scene in the film in particular involves Silkwood activating a radiation alarm at the plant. She supposedly had about 40 times the legal limit of radioactive contamination in her system. Movie posters for the film featured a preamble that read, On November 13, 1974, Karen Silkwood, an employee of a nuclear facility, left to meet with a reporter from the New York Times. She never got there. Once filming was completed and the movie was in post-production, Mike Nichols and the editor Sam Osteen ran into a major problem regarding the way Karen's death was depicted. Kerr McGee, the company that she worked for, threatened legal action against the film if anything was portrayed that was not 100% factually accurate. In the original cut of the film, it shows her leaving the union meeting at the coffee shop with another friend following her out on her way to deliver the papers that she intended to share with the New York Times reporter. It shows Silkwood saying goodbye to her friend as she gets into her car and starts it. The moment that she pulls into traffic, the headlights blink on in the car that's parked behind her. This was an uh-oh moment, but they had to take that shot completely out of the film. Now all you see is a time jump where she's driving at night and sees headlights from the car behind her in her rearview mirror. The very next shot is of her wrecked car. So in the final cut, it wasn't as clear that somebody was following her. 
And Meryl Streep didn't like one scene in the film, particularly that scene was where Karen flashes her breast to her co-workers while she's on the job. It was a scene that made her feel terribly awkward. And she herself is not a fan of women doing nude scenes in films. It's just kind of a personal gripe of hers. She went ahead and did this in context of the film because she really felt like Karen would probably do something like that. It made complete sense to her, but she did feel like it was a completely bizarre thing for her to do, and it was really hard to do in front of the crew. Karen Silkwood's parents and former roommate Sherry Ellis were really unhappy with the film's final outcome. Her father believed that Karen was a whole lot smarter than it was shown in the film, while her roommate, Sherry Ellis, objected to Cher's depiction of Dolly, even though it wasn't based expressly on her. Other people that knew Karen thought the film was great because they felt like it made her stand out as being a human being instead of a myth. Despite Karen's fame after her death, her three children never fully got over her leaving them with their father and his girlfriend, this happening after their parents split up. They were really glad once the publicity finally died down. They felt like it made it easier for them to move on but they've stated that they really appreciate what she did in the world, but they can't really appreciate what was done for them in general. It's said that Cher was really nervous about meeting Meryl Streep for the first time. She even described it almost like having an audience with the Pope. But Streep, however, immediately put her at ease. She threw her arms around her, and told her she was glad that she was there. During filming, they hung out together a lot and became steadfast friends, talking about their kids, music, and what they wanted in life. One of the first major tasks that Cher had to tackle when she arrived on location was to find the right look for her character of Dolly. In the beginning, Dolly was written as a glamorous barrel rider, They tried a screen test of Cher with that look, but the director didn't like it at all. Nichols told Cher to wash her face, then wash her hair, and let it dry flat to her head without doing anything to it. Then he and costume designer Ann Roth began to dress her in dowdy clothes, working hard to strip every trace of glamour from the usually picture-perfect star. She had lost every bit of her sex appeal that she had strived so hard to gain. But the director was down-out serious about her not wearing any makeup at all. He would actually come up to her daily and give her what she called the white glove test. He would run his fingers across her cheek to make sure that she hadn't snuck a touch of something on her face. At one point in the filming, she had tried to cheat and went ahead and curled her eyelashes. The director caught her and told her not to do it again. He said it in a very sweet way, but she got the message that he wasn't messing around. Now, if you would love to watch this movie and stream it tonight, you're not going to have much luck. For some unknown reason, it's one of those films that just doesn't make it online. So if you want to see it, you're probably going to have to watch it by purchasing a DVD of it. The film eventually earned about $35 million in the U.S. and Canada upon its release, and it received basically positive critical responses. Hopefully at some point you'll be able to stream this and watch this fantastic movie from 1983. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll continue to chase the classics.